Bleed Shamelessly is a Wisconsin-based campaign working to provide accessible menstrual products and cohesive menstrual education. They are currently hosting a COVID-19 virtual campaign with James Madison Memorial High School to work towards gender inclusivity and menstrual equality. We're so excited to welcome them on. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's super cool to be on here. Yeah. Do you guys want to give a short introduction to who you are um, and who you are with the organization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Maggie DeSanza. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a junior at James Madison Memorial High School in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm the founder of Bleed Shamelessly and just have really enjoyed working more closely with Anika and Amira um, in particular during this uh, quarantine, even though we haven't been socially near each other or physically near each other, we've definitely been working very closely. So it's been great. Hi, I'm Anika. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm also junior at James Madison Memorial with Maggie. And I'm an organizer with Bleed Shamelessly. Hi, my name is Amira. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. I am a sophomore at Memorial High School, and I am also an organizer with Bleed Shamelessly. And like Maggie said, it's just been so fantastic to work with these two um, over COVID. They're both so inspiring and fantastic ac activists. So we start off kind of with a lightning round. So girls, stargazing or morning walks? Morning walks, I think. <laughs> Um, I'm definitely a night owl, so I'd have, I'd have to say stargazing. Morning walks. Yeah, awesome. I think Amira and I are both, like, morning people. <laughs> cool, I am too. Yeah. <laughs> um, lemonade or iced tea? Iced lemonade. tea. Ooh. Ooh, iced tea. I'd have to go with Maggie on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I could choose. I think I'd do, like, half and half. <laughs> <laughs> Um, ocean waves or rain sounds? Rain sounds rain. all the way. Yeah, rain like sounds that. all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, extravagant or mi minimalist? I try to be minimalist, but, you know, <laughs> it's hard in the society we live in. <laughs> so sequence. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I'm also definitely, like, more, I, I definitely have a lot of clutter, more than I would like to say I have. <laughs> I'm with Anika on that one. I'm like, okay, everything, I'm going to have it all organized, and then by the end of the day, it's just all a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> I live in New York in a very, very small one bedroom, and it's just piled with things. <laughs> yeah. Um, pizza or sushi? Sushi, hands down. Mm. I'm gonna go pizza. Sushi, oh. I'm a vegetarian, <laughs> but <laughs> but vegetarian sushi is also great too. So Japanese is one of my favorite cuisines, so like definitely sushi. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so can you guys start off by talking about what is bleed shamelessly? Um, Maggie, do you wanna do you wanna start? Yeah, um, so Bleed Shamelessly is a youth-run um, campaign and organization that has been working for the past two years to make Dane County and Southern Wisconsin um, a more menstrually equitable place. So what's that, what that means is we engage in educational activities, service, community outreach, and also legislative change. Um, so we have done presentations, um, made sure to educate our community about what menstruation is on one hand, but also how we can respect all menstruating people. Um, we have worked with legislators trying to abolish the tampon tax and make menstrual products more accessible. And of course, like we're doing right now in quarantine, we have worked towards service, which is getting pads and tampons and all menstrual products out there to people in the community who need them. Wow, that's incredible. And um, how did you end up starting um, Bleach Shamelessly? You said it's a two years old organization. Yeah, um, so I ended in Madison, we have a ton of really cool opportunities for youth who are interested in organizing activism. Um, and I actually joined a camp called Rise Up and Write, and I was super into activism and feminism, and I was like, I love writing too, so it was like everything that I wanted in one like activity. Um, and I met some really awesome youth who were also starting projects from immigrant rights to bo body positivity. 
and work with some educators in the community. Some were professors at UW-Madison, others were writing teachers, and we kind of just like started our own campaigns and I just ran with it even after Rise Up and Write. So now we're here. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. How, how did that go from like writing to menstrual equality? Um, was that something that you were focusing on at this camp? Yeah, so at the camp, I, we were kind of cho told to choose like an issue that you felt super passionate about or that you felt represented what you wanted to specifically work on in terms of change and um, pro progress in our community. And that was kind of hard for me because I really am like invested in most things, all things social justice. Um, but, you know, I was kind of looking at reproductive justice and reproductive rights as like a sector of that and kind of thinking how little our culture talks about menstruation. Um, and then I learned more about how we can incorporate writing and the written language um, into our activism and how mm -hmm. crucial writing op-eds and letters and you know communicating with people, even in just an email, is so vital to organizing and making change. Wow. And Amira and Anika, you guys are both organizers in the organization. Um, can you talk about that? And how did you guys first get involved with Maggie and Bleed Shamelessly? Yeah, so Maggie actually reached out to me um, if I would like to participate in the organization. It's truly been an incredible opportunity to get to work with her and Bleed Shamelessly. And um, really help contribute to some of the great work Bleed Shamelessly is doing in our community to help raise awareness about menstrual equity and destigmatize the conversation regarding periods. Yeah, last year I was a fresh person at my high school and I joined the women's club and we were doing presentations on menstrual equity to a bunch of the health classes and, or sorry, a bunch of the history classes for like we had our human rights week. So Maggie at the end of it was like, oh, well, if people are interested in doing more, I run this organization called Bleed Shamelessly. And I was like, you are one year older than me and you're doing what? So <laughs> um, this year I joined and it's just been absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah. And so you've also been working with the community during COVID when your high school is shut down. What have you guys been doing with that? And how have you been getting the word out while stuck at home? We've been using social media a lot as a tool to help communicate what's happening, like where our drop-off centers are and um, helping raise awareness about our GoFundMe. Um, we've also been using like going on a lot of like different um, news sites and having like a lot of conversations with people in our community, um, just helping raise awareness about what we're doing to help um, spread our efforts across Dane County, which is where we live. Oh, great. Yeah. What exactly are you guys doing? So you're, you're giving menstrual projects to those in need? Is that, is that what I'm understanding? What we've been doing is reaching out to clinics, shelters, and other areas that give back to the community. Um, and we're saying, hey, do you need menstrual products? And if so, would you like them in bulk or would you like us to make packs? So we use data from the period movement organization, which was founded, co-founded by Nadia Okamoto, um, which says that the average menstruator will use about nine tampons and six pads over one menstrual cycle. So what we do is we have uh, lots and lots and lots of tampons and pads shipped to our houses. Um, we like put on our masks and our gloves and we just pack them and then deliver them to these. Wow. That's yeah, and so far we've, um, I think, distributed over 2,700 um, menstrual packs. Um, or the equivalent of that of what it would be in bulk and at, across like 11 different shelters and food pantries in southern Wisconsin um, and we're only adding more to the list so we're not slowing down. <laughs> wow that's amazing. Do you get people to donate from within the community? Um, so uh, one of our major sources of getting pads and tampons um, is from our GoFundMe but we've also accepted donations and um, we have to be careful about that because it's like COVID and we don't want to ensure that we're putting any of the menstruators we're helping serve at risk. Um, so usually we just source and buy directly from our um, producers 
but we do um, sometimes accept donations from the community, but we just have to be careful to ensure that they're totally safe. Oh, that makes sense. Wow. Um, and then something that you've also that you also mentioned um, within your mission was um, like helping with period poverty. Can you tell our listeners what is that and um, what what can we be doing to help? Yeah. So period poverty is basically the phenomenon that menstruation, um, a natural bodily process that nearly half of the population, just over half of the population experiences, um, debilitates someone economically and ultimately career-wise and politically. Um, so often a lot of people, be it economic instability, other responsibilities, not having access to menstrual products at work or at school, are unable to get the products that they need to um, be successful and productive in our society. So that hinders people from going to school and ultimately work um, and can really put a huge damper on someone's life, um, not just career-wise and educationally, but also health-wise. You know, when people don't have access to sanitary menstrual products, it can force them to use things like cloth, pat, like old, old clothes, um, rags, cardboard, different things like that, which is obviously super unhealthy for our reproductive systems and can lead to toxic shock syndrome, infertility, um, and a whole bunch of other infections that are s incredibly debilitating for people. What are ways that we can help if we're not in Wisconsin, if we're not um, in your county? What, what can we do to help with period poverty? So the first thing that you can do is check to see what laws are in your state. The vast majority of states have a form of what is called the tampon tax, which is a tax on tampons and other menstrual products as a luxury item alongside chocolate or alcohol, whereas products such as Viagra are deemed a necessity. So if you do find that your state has a lot like this, there are many petitions that you can sign saying, I want my legislators to look into abolishing the tampon tax because that is a huge part of the economic burden on menstruators. Another thing you can do is push legislators to pass laws that um, put free pads and tampons in all state-funded buildings such as like it would be your state capital, it would be public schools. And not just in the women's restrooms, but in the gender neutral restrooms and the men's restrooms for trans and gender expansive menstruators. Next, you can help support menstruators on the local level by donating period products to schools, which often don't have enough, um, and to shelters, clinics. Menstrual products are one of the most needed product in shelters, but the least donated. Um, to add on to that, I think it's really important that we talk about menstruation and destigmatize the issue. Because one of the major reasons that we have all these barriers to accessing safe and healthy menstrual products is because the issue is so heavily stigmatized in our society. So just by talking about it with your friends, with your peers, with even your educators and the people who are responsible for teaching you what your period is at a young age, I think it's really important that we talk about our periods and normalize the fact that it's a biological function and it's not something that we can just not, we can ignore. Anika, I think that's awesome and something that we're trying to do with this podcast is open the conversation as to like anything that we as women or any female identifying person like wants to talk about um so thank you guys and then something that you brought up amira that i'd like to ask you guys about is part of your mission is to talk about all the different ways people can have periods um and can you talk about how periods extend beyond uh the gender of female mm -hmm. yeah definitely so my gender is non-binary and I menstruate. One of the stigmas and stereotypes around menstruation is that only women can menstruate and women have to menstruate. And this comes from this idea of not even thinking of that about trans menstruators. When trans people are thought about often, the dots aren't connected that, oh, if they, have a functioning reproductive system, a healthy reproductive system, that they will menstruate as well. 
the idea that that all women menstruate and that all menstruators are women is really stigmatizing for trans women who may be intersex or male they will never partake in what is culturally symbolized as you're coming into womanhood and it's really dysphoric for a lot of people on the other hand for gender expansive non-binary and trans menstruators. Your period can be a reminder of what society is saying, which is that you are a woman, you have to be a woman, you are a woman because you menstruate, and nothing else matters. And when these topics aren't talked about, then we start to see gaps in our legislature and in community action. When we're pushing for menstrual products to be put in schools? Are we making sure that we're also asking for menstrual products to be put in the men's and gender neutral restrooms? When we talk about menstrual products, are we using the word feminine, alienating folk who identify as mask or as androgynous or are not women? And it's these little things which may not seem like much, but when they compound one on top of the other, we see this huge vast system of inequities where mm -hmm. menstruators who are gender expansive or trans or non-binary, they, they just slip through the, the cracks. Another part of this I just also want to mention is that not all female women, cisgender women, are menstruators as well. If you think about women who have reached menopause or some women and females will not have menstruation for another reason. Thank you so much for getting into that. Um, I know that's something that we don't really talk about. And how are you, as, at, at Weeds Shamelessly, how are you opening up that conversation? How are you bringing it out into the communities of Madison? So oh, one of the things that we really want to bring to light, just like Amira said, is that the people, trans, gender expansive, non-binary people are menstruating in our communities, and they feel all the similar symptoms and experience menstruation. Um, just like any other menstruating person does, and it doesn't make them any less of their identity, just like um, trans women, people who identify as women but may not menstruate doesn't make them any less of a woman for not menstruating. So just bringing that out into the community, having conversations about it, ensuring that when we're talking about menstrually equitable policy and legislation, that we are making sure that it is trans inclusive. All of those things, just like getting products in men's and gender neutral restrooms as well, just making sure that we're always keeping it in the back of our minds whenever we're talking about menstrual equity. Thank you so much. And can you guys talk about what's happening in Wisconsin now? Um, I know this week has there's seen a lot of unrest throughout our whole country. Is that happening in Madison? And are you guys participating in um, in in the protests? In Madison, downtown Madison, um, there was a protest this Saturday, and they've been going on throughout the week. This week of action, um, and there the protest. Um, did result in riots and looting. Um, but I think it's really important to be mindful of the fact that stores can be rebuilt and, but like lives can't. So I think that's really important just to keep in our mind as we're talking about all these issues. To, to finish up, I just wanna ask you guys like, tell me about Wisconsin, tell me about Madison. What are your, what are your favorite things to do there when we're not in quarantine. <laughs> What's your favorite restaurant if, if someone were to go there? Yeah, one of my favorite things to do on Madison is to go down to the terrace. So in Madison, we are very lucky to have four beautiful lakes. Um, so my favorite thing to do is like with my family or with my friends is on a beautiful summer night, go down to the terrace, which is right on the water. Um, usually there's some live music, you just get some food and you just hang and it's just really nice. Wow, yeah. that sounds lovely. <laughs> Maggie, <laughs> what's your favorite thing? Um, I would say I really like I, I love the terrace. Amira stole mine. Um, <laughs> I really, really love State Street and downtown Madison. I think that we have a really awesome downtown and there are tons of local businesses, cute like little um, knickknack shops and different, you know, just local businesses that you feel good supporting. Um, and they're just like really cool. You get to know people there. Um, yeah, there are just a bunch of cool like shopping centers downtown. If, 
for like a fun like Saturday evening with like your friends and family. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, my favorite thing is there's like this outdoor mall called Hillel next to like downtown Madison. Um, I really love Asian cuisine. I think I mentioned that earlier, but I'm literally <laughs> obsessed with it. So there's this place called Bamboo where they make all these like really cool um, types of like che. It's a type of tea and they also do like bubble tea um, with like egg foam and it's really cool. They have all these different variations um, that I'm absolutely obsessed with. <laughs> Okay, I love I them. Have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Bubble tea is my favorite thing ever. Oh my gosh, same. <laughs> have, we have like, two like good bubble tea restaurants in Madison. We have bamboo and kung fu tea, which is just I really love good. kung fu tea. There's kung fu tea is so good. In New York. <laughs> <laughs> a visitor. <laughs> it's actually a problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and then to, to leave off, um, can you guys, if you, so if you had a, one piece of advice to give a woman just on the street or, or anyone you encounter, um, I guess I'm going to stop using gender as well. Um, uh, what would you say to them? Whoa. Um. <laughs> I know. Hello. Yeah. I've never met you. Here's some yeah. advice. <laughs> I would probably say to trust resilience and especially in terms of activism and understand that um people and like communities and networks are stronger than um oppressive powers or people who are trying to restrict rights or access um and you know if we can communally come together and it's kind of cheesy but come together and recognize that together we are so much stronger than a lot of the forces and um, entities that we think have these huge control over our lives when in reality we are the ones in control and we can control it and it just requires communities coming together. Thank you Maggie. Yeah, I totally agree with everything that you just said. Um, I think my advice would be to talk about your period, right? Because it's totally normal. It's a biological function and there's no need to stigmatize it. I think people just like need to talk about their periods to get comfortable with it, to help target some of these barriers that we see with menstrual inequity. Thank you, Anika. Well, those are really hard to follow. Um, <laughs> so my advice is just that you're valid no matter what your feelings are, no matter what you're facing today or yesterday or whenever. Um, no matter if everyone else around you thinks that your reactions are ridiculous or exaggerated, like, you know you, you know your feelings or whatever they are, they matter. And that there are thousands of people out there who support you for being you and for speaking your truth. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you guys would like to add um, in, in regards to Bleed Shamelessly? Um, what's next for you all? And how can we follow you and continue to hear about your pro progress? Yeah, this is so funny. We had a meeting a day ago and was like, what are we going to, we need a brain. <laughs> like, well, what comes next this summer? Um, yeah, I'm sure we've all been kind of like brainstorming and thinking about that. Um, I know that next we want to apply for nonprofit status um, to ensure that we can have more, you know, more access in terms of funding and working with legislators, that kind of stuff, more legitimate. Um, we want to continue working towards taking down the tampon tax in Wisconsin. Um, and for the duration of the pandemic, we want to ensure that we can provide community members with the menstrual products that they need to succeed and be comfortable um, during COVID-19 and quarantine. Um, but beyond that, we want to move towards making preventative change and not just reactionary within COVID-19 um, and make sure that what we can bring to the table lasts longer than where we will be, where, wherever in like five years, we still want, you know, menstrual equity to be a conversation and to be brought up in Dane County and in Southern Wisconsin, even no matter where the three of us or the Bleed Shamelessly team is. Thank you so much for being on today. It was a pleasure to get to know you and to hear a little bit more about what you guys are up to. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for having us. Yeah. yeah.